We heard from Guy this morning that some of us were at the IATA annual general meeting in Dubai. You were not there. You were missed, obviously. But uh, the good news is that you know we, we can give you some feedback from the event. And one of the great questions, uh, really, that came up there, or one of the great topics of discussion, was the demand is there. You know, people are flying again. Um, but what's lacking at this point is the aircraft, quite frankly. There's a lot of frustration among the carriers uh, that, that say, we would like to fly more, we have to wait for some of our planes longer than we would like to, we have to use older planes that we would like to. It, what do you say to that? Yeah. Uh, indeed, uh, the traffic is back, and um, that's really good news. It's back to uh, what it was before COVID. And um, indeed, at the same time, the uh, delivery of new aircraft is very far from uh, where it was um, in 2018, 2019. Uh, I can only speak for our contribution uh, to that capacity. Um, we had to take decisions when we were confronted with COVID to reduce production. Uh, we decided to reduce moderately the production at that time. That created inventory that we were then able to uh, reduce um, to burn in the course of 21 and then we were back um, in 2022 in more normal times in terms of inventory. But uh, due to a number of events, in particular COVID but not limited to COVID, um, the supply chain found itself at a very low point mm. uh, with a lot of people having left the industry and it took time to bring people back, to train them um, and to qualify them for jobs which are uh, highly qualified jobs. So we have a lot of players in the industry that found itself uh, incapable, um, mostly but not only for uh, skills reason, incapable of romping at the pace that, um, that we required. Uh, we consider today that at Airbus, we are sized for the ramp up that we are targeting, but we are suffering from a lot of problems in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we are doing today, what we've been doing in the last two years, is to really support the supply chain, understand their problems, find the solutions which are uh, diverse. Some have issues with labor, still. Uh, others have financial issues um, because they have to um, tap into their um, balance sheet due to important working capital requirements because of the ramp up and higher rates. Um, also because they have profitability issues sometimes due to the inflation on labor, on raw material, uh, obviously on energy. Um, we know what it means here in Europe. So there are a lot of challenges. It's not that the supply chain is not ramping up, but it's that it's not ramping up at the pace we would need. Uh, we are not back to where we were in 19, mm -hmm. uh, and that's basically um, a problem. We are targeting much higher rates by 2026 than what we had in 19, and therefore this gap between the demand that right. is very strong and the supply is probably the most um, urging challenge mm -hmm. that we're trying to overcome. How long do you think this will continue? Uh, do you have, I mean, this year it seems like you're working on the problem, but you won't have clarity yet this year. Is this something that will stay with you into 25 and maybe beyond? Well, I believe it's here to stay for two to three years, mm -hmm. maybe more, I don't know, because as we see the supply chain improving, we keep ramping up. So the more they, they produce, the more we need, and uh, we are very fortunate to have in front of us a very important backlog of orders to deliver. Uh, but that comes with higher rates if we want to uh, be at the pace expected by customers. And therefore, I think it will at least take two to three years to see a certain normalization. And as you know, we intend to stop the, the ramp up at rate 75 per month on the A320 family, that will be the moment where the supply chain will be able to stabilize, work on its efficiency, productivity, and also uh, significantly improve the, the state of the balance sheet. So that's something that is uh, on the horizon, but 2026 is still uh, two years out. Mm. So as you are stabilizing your production line, ramping up, also at the same time supporting um, the suppliers, you are at the same time looking far into the future, five, ten years ahead, looking at, and you know, we are at a sustainable, uh, we are at a sort of uh, summit looking at the future, you are looking at your next product. You have two in mind, you have the hydrogen aircraft in mind, you have a, shall we say, advanced version of what you do now in mind. Can you do all of those things at the same time? Can you stabilize your current business and 
start thinking ahead? Yes. Um, and in a word. One in, <laughs> one in the other are, are um, fertilizing each other. So mm -hmm. the ramp up is generating um, profits that we are investing in R&T, R&D, and at a later stage um, in new programs. That's the, the way it works. So we are very much looking forward to the time where we will stabilize the production to launch those big investments to have also a supply chain that will be stabilized for this uh, new wave of investments. Um, indeed, as it was explained this morning uh, by uh, Christian, uh, we have a plan to decarbonize aviation. That's something that is extremely important in my perspective. We don't want to uh, to stop flying to reduce emissions. We want to reduce emissions to keep flying because uh, uh, Minister Habeck explained it. Flying is, is a freedom and, and is a need for, for humanity. So that's something we want to preserve. But we are absolutely conscious of the speed of climate change and there's a race on technologies and on solutions to decarbonize. And therefore we have those uh, technological uh, development at the time with a lot of uh, studies, tests, um, evaluation in flight. Uh, to mature the technologies and then be ready for the end of the decade to launch uh, programs for entry into service by 2035 for hydrogen mm -hmm. and the uh, second half of the next decade for the successor of the today's very successful A320 family. So that's, that's something for the second of half of next decade. Entry into service, second mm -hmm. half of the next decade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Give us a sense of, I mean, obviously these kinds of programs are hugely complicated and also very expensive. Do we have any sense of what kind of investment you have to put into these and where this money will be coming from? Can we expect launch aid? Sort of how, how are you thinking about setting that up? Yeah, so primarily it's, um, it's uh, Airbus investing in its, mm. uh, in its products. Um, there are in aviation different ways of uh, funding the programs. Uh, I think what has been very successful for Airbus and for Europe is the partnership between a number of states and the manufacturer because aviation is much more than a plane, it's an ecosystem and it's been a way to uh, make sure that this ecosystem is, f is supported and that the states have skin in the game in the success. Uh, we are not at that point, uh, but we believe it's a priority of states to decarbonize, it's also our priority. Aviation is more than a business, it has some sovereign dimensions and social dimensions, so at a point in time we will be coming to those discussions, uh, but we are not yet there. Today we are um, uh, full speed on the technologies, uh, testing different technologies uh, on the propulsion side. I see my uh, colleague from uh, Safran, uh, part of the CFM joint venture uh, for the uh, next generation of single aisle. We are working with uh, CFM for the the RISE option, which would be an open rotor uh, technology. There are other options. So we are testing those different options uh, to come to the point where uh, we know what we want to develop and we can then uh, enter into discussion with uh, the supply base and all the potential stakeholders uh, for the, um, the development and also to find the right scheme of funding, uh, risk sharing mm -hmm. and, um, um, and joint success. Mm -hmm. Where will the sort of greatest thrust of the innovation come from? You, you mentioned Safran and their role, or the engine maker's role on cutting emissions, on making more fuel efficient planes. Is that really where most of the gains will be coming from in future? We heard about shark skins this morning. Is, how much can Airbus proper contribute? How much of it is in the propulsion? So um, I think to, to put uh, things in a simple way, mm. um, we have two axes of improvement. The first one is to develop planes that will need less fuel to fly. And the second one is to have fuels that will put less carbon in the air. So the SAF and the hydrogen part is really the second one. When we look at the first part, uh, developing planes that will require less fuel to fly, actually there are two main shares. The first one is to have a plane that requires, that needs less energy. Mm -hmm. And the second one, a propulsion system that needs less fuel for the same amount of energy. So that's the fuel efficiency of the propulsion system inside a more effective plane. And when we look at the next generation of planes, it's probably two half uh, that um, have to complement each other. Uh, half coming from the the plane, the architecture, the wing, the weight, and those kind of things. And the other half, and it's a lot uh, from the propulsion system. Mm -hmm. But the plane will probably still look, you know, we, if we look at the photo here of the blended wing aircraft, the next generation plane, do you think will still very much look like the aircraft that we're all used to these days? There will be some significant differences, mm -hmm. probably in the wingspan, in the size of the, 
of the engine, uh, maybe uh, uh, open rotor, so looking a bit different. Um, the very futuristic uh, blended, um, wing, blended wing design is something we are considering probably for later um, in, the, in the century and also probably for bigger planes. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to make an efficient uh, blended wing uh, architecture on a smaller plane. But we're still in the phase of competing different technologies. Mm -hmm. Some are quite advanced and surprising, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the ones that have made their, their demonstrations and uh, have proved to be uh, efficient in the past decades um, are still mm -hmm. uh, quite uh, promising. So the blended wing is a concept that maybe further down the line, the like, next, next generation is something that you could consider for for some type of aircraft. It, it's yeah. an architecture that brings uh, significant improvement in, um, mm. in fuel burn, but there are also some downsides on the, on the architecture. So it's in competition with others. Uh, for the moment, I continue to believe it is more likely that the traditional architecture, as it mm. comes to the fuselage and the mm. wing, mm -hmm. uh, will prevail for the next generation. Mm. One other frustration that a lot of airlines have shared for this year, most certainly, is that they lack real alternatives. The, you know, the, the civil aviation industry is in a duopoly. You, know, you have Airbus on one side, you have Boeing on the other side for the large civil aircraft. Is this something that we will have to live with for the next generation? We've seen a little bit of movement out of China. We have some smaller players in Brazil, but by and large, this remains an industry split among two big players. Is that healthy? Uh. It's not on me to judge. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm here representing one of those, uh, mm. of those two players. You, do you, do you uh, understand the frustration that well, you know, customers uh, might have? They might uh, express frustrations, but they're also happy to have our solutions. And I um, um, was discussing recently with some of them. Yeah, they, they're happy to rely on us. Mm. Uh, they like our products um, and they praise the products. They need those products to um, make the improvement in competitiveness, uh, in fuel efficiency, in reducing the fuel burn. And actually, when it comes to Airbus, they are just encouraging us to, to do more of what we're doing and to do it better and to do it faster, especially on the availability of the aircraft as they need to replace their fleet. So um, I will not judge or comment on how many players should be in this industry. Uh, we are one of them. We're investing. Uh, we, we, we're innovating, mm -hmm. we're pioneering, as it is uh, written here, has been quite successful in the past uh, uh, years and decades to move in that direction in the way we're doing it, and we want to continue to challenge ourselves every day um, and, and not being complacent on what we do, mm -hmm. but obviously we want to keep investing and innovating, and if those products correspond to what the customers want, so be it, mm -hmm. we're happy with it. Where will the next big competitor come from? Do you think it's China that is making these moves and that we should take seriously as a possible third player? Today, uh, there are two main competitors um, that are serving the bulk of the market. Um, and the main products available uh, come from those two competitors. Indeed, Comac has introduced recently the 919. Um, Comac is a state-owned company that is heavily supported by the, by the government and that has a market, uh, the Chinese market, that represents 20% of the global market. So they have indeed uh, a unique place to enter a plane in service, to validate, develop, mature the plane, and therefore we have to take them serious, and, mm -hmm. and we do take them serious, and it's quite likely that we, they will take a significant share of the Chinese market in the coming years, and as we know, they have applied for a, um, a European certification of the, mm -hmm. of the plane, so they have the ambition to come to the international market, and that's the nature of uh, competition, mm -hmm. that there is room for new entrants, so we are looking at them, we take them very serious, they're competitors, but they are at the beginning of their history. Mm. I'd like to end on something uh, slightly more political, shall we say, or political um, economic. Europe votes in the next couple of days, and there's been a lot of discussion, does Europe still have you know, the, the punch, do, do they still have it in them to innovate, do we, can we still uh, come up with national champions? Airbus often is described as such a European champion. You're all over the, the entire region. You have a strong base in France and Hamburg in different parts of the region. What's your view at this point? Do you feel that you have the political backing to do what you want to do? Do you feel that you have the reach into universities, the reach into the personnel? Do you feel that you're comfortable where you are in Europe now? Would you think maybe 
this market is not what is not giving me what I need. I might need to start looking elsewhere more globally. So I think we should not be shy of um, uh, what we are doing. Um, and when we create the conditions for the business uh, to, to grow and to perform in terms of technologies, in terms of skills, in terms of ability to uh, go to market, um, we, we are good. And, and we can compete uh, with the US, with China, where they are competitive of uh, other uh, large nations. I think one of the weaknesses of Europe is when we don't manage to come together with the scale of Europe. Uh, I have to say Airbus, um, is a project that was a European project of all countries or main countries coming together and giving the scale that is required to be competitive over time uh, with the scale of the US in aviation or uh, potentially on the long run with China. We've done the same on missiles, uh, creating MBDA 20 years ago, taking the remains of uh, more national businesses that were not performing and once we created the scale, uh, we've been able to uh, compete and, and be very competitive on the marketplace. There are fields like defense, like space, where today uh, the mindset is still very national, mm. uh, and therefore it's much more difficult to create that scale. I think we really need, we Europeans, to come together much more on uh, technologies, on, on systems where scale matters, because there's a huge amount of investment to be made for rather small number of products. Uh, and when Europe is capable of this, uh, then there's no limit to what we can, be, uh, we can be doing. Do other executives come to you and say, what's your magic trick? What, how could I integrate more with other players? What advice would you give them? Well, I think that one thing that um, Airbus has managed very well over the years is to be a real European company, mm. where you have uh, European people working together uh, and with uh, a mindset of collective success. Uh, that's probably the very nature of, uh, of Airbus. It's more than a company. It's a project of collaboration that started in Europe and that I think now today is also a, a success story going global. Because once you have learned to cooperate among Europeans, uh, you're very much capable of working with other cultures. And that's what we need in this world. We need to be able to access, to, to, to communicate, to, to be more than an export company from one region of the world, but to become really a, a global player um, if you want to be credible, if you want to understand what's happening in different places of the world and be competitive and be relevant um, in these uh, businesses. That's what we're trying to do in a very humble way. And when we are asked what is the magic recipe for, for your success, I mean, it just applies for us. Uh, I think that's this very cultural part of what Airbus is made of. There you go, your magic trick. I'd like to leave it at that, on that positive note. Thank you very much, Guillaume, for that great Thank conversation. Thank you, Benedict. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah.